top of the show here. Uh, I, I wanted to get uh, Michael Powell on. Uh, he is the author of uh, a piece that uh, just went up at the New York Times yesterday uh, about uh, Adolf Reed, uh, who's one of my favorite thinkers on the left, uh, and how there was an incident where Reed was supposed to speak uh, to um, a meeting that was on Zoom, of course, because of the pandemic, co-sponsored by a couple of different branches of the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, the main socialist organization in the United States, and why that became so controversial. Right? So, um, so first of all, Michael, thank you so much for coming on. Sure, my pleasure, Ben. So, I mean, I, I guess, uh, I guess first, you know, first things first, right? So just basically since, you know, my hope at least uh, is that there will people be people who watch this who aren't like immersed in the subcultural trivia of debates uh, between different kinds of socialists. Uh, I, th I think like a good, a good place to start is, um, is who is this guy? Like what, why is Adolf Reed somebody who, who would normally be invited to a, so speak at a socialist meeting? Well, you know, it, that's a great question. I mean, and, and I should say I've read, you know, Adolf Reed for, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, and, and I think he's one of the more, the most challenging and interesting uh, and often counterintuitive thinkers on the left. It uh, doesn't mean you always agree with him, but he course, is, no. you know, he's formidable and, and, and he brings, you know, he brings it. Um, and he was, you know, I mean, his, I think it's fair to say one of his longtime takes, um, mm. you know, has been the importance, he certainly does not, he certainly does not say that race doesn't matter. He doesn't go that, there, but he says that, you know, without an understanding also of class, and of the, uh, you know, that, that, that a left analysis and a left organizing will ultimately founder without, without the two of those. And in the case of, in this case, I mean, he was bringing up around COVID-19 um, that much of the discourse uh, for some period of time had been on dis uh, racial disparities. Um, I think foremost probably on, um, you know, African-Americans who, and let's be clear, I mean, were disproportionately getting sick and were disproportionately dying, I think, because of the nature of the work that they were doing, which is right. very often frontline, and because they live, uh, they, because many African Americans, certainly poor and working class, I speak it like from Brooklyn where I live, they yeah. live in crowded conditions. So, what, but what he argued is that, look, if you focus on that, if you focus on those disparities, um, you're left with a, you're, you're left with a, with a or, you're, or you're running the danger of falling into old kind of race, um, you know, race-based ideas of kind of medicine, of biology, of race. And he thought that was a dead end. And, yeah, and, and yeah. yeah. So, so, so one way to think about this, uh, certainly in terms of his immediate concern there, is that uh, if you if you're saying all right, so uh, black people, members of other minority groups are more likely to die of COVID than, than white people. So that could be for two reasons, right? One is that is some sort of um, genetic thing, and and while it's not impossible that sometimes you could have clusters of genetic traits that roughly track what we call race, um, by and large, that's that's not generally the most useful place to look uh, because hey, race, right, is, is a mostly a pseudoscientific concept, right? It's, it's a sort of socially and historically contingent way of sorting people, right? You know, but, but it's, it's yes. not actually that biologically mm -hmm. meaningful. Um, but really, you know, the, the main reason, right, that black people are more likely to die of COVID than white people is the unequal distribution of poverty. That, um, you know, as you say, black people are more likely than white people to be so-called essential workers, of course, so essential that they're uh, being paid almost nothing, to, you know, to, uh, you know, certainly much less. they not given proper PPE and all, everything. Yes, precisely. Yeah. Uh, and now, of course, uh, that does have to do with uh, the history of de jure racial apartheid in the United States, going from slavery to Jim Crow, 
to uh, FHA redlining very recently. Um, and Adolf Freed of all people uh, is, is not um, unaware of this stuff, right? You know, he's, he's, he's written extensively for decades about that history. Uh, he grew up, uh, as you mentioned in the article, uh, in, you know, the Jim Crow, you know, as a black man in the Jim Crow South um, and, and has, uh, has a long history of engaging with those issues. Uh, but I think his, his perspective, uh, given his understanding of the socialist project, is that we shouldn't think that, all right, imagine if you could somehow correct all of these racial disparities immediately. I don't know how that would happen without some kind of massive redistribution. But, you know, but if you could, and so you had exactly proportional numbers of white people and black people living in miserable grinding poverty, uh, being economically coerced to, you know, to go to work as essential workers during a plague, uh, being victimized by the style of aggressive and militaristic policing that's used to uh, police poor neighborhoods. Uh, and the proportions were exactly right as the portions of the population. This isn't really an exciting vision of a just and free society. Um, and, and instead, you know, from, from his perspective, what we should really be focused on is, is the poverty, right? You know, we should be real about that unequal distribution of poverty and the historical injustices it reflects. Uh, but, but the main thing we want to go after is not like equalizing who's at the bottom of the ladder, but um, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably going to mix my metaphors horribly here, but like, you know. I yeah. think, I mean, look, I, I recently did a book on the Navajo uh, and, and the Navajo got absolutely slammed by COVID-19. The Navajo in, in uh, mainly in Arizona, also New Mexico, a little bit of uh, uh, Utah. In Arizona, which has gotten slammed of late, the whites are leading, you know, if you will, whites are the worst hit there yeah. because, I mean, we could pull a variety of reasons, but whites tend to be, that there's a fair number of working class and poor whites. They tend to be in a lot of those frontline jobs. They've gotten hammered. In, in Texas, Latinos, you know, the, the, the biggest infection and death rates among Latinos, blacks are also getting hit, to be clear. Whites are also getting hit, but Latinos are far and away the one getting slammed the hardest. If you go to a place like Florida, I believe it is African Americans. I mean, the point is, right, I mean, you know, the commonality is not like there's some um, genetic commonality there. The commonality, it seems to me, is two things, right? One is poverty, working class poverty, and frontline jobs. You know, those are the people, whether, and again, frontline is an interesting, you know, term mm -hmm. of art. It could be, you could be a, a nurse. You also could be just packing groceries in a store, and it isn't like you signed up to be a frontline worker. Right. You are. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you've 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 just been told that uh, that you're you're on the front lines now, but <laughs> yeah. uh, but no no combat pay. That's not going to happen. Uh, right. Yeah. So um, so so what what's interesting about this, right? So the the core of this this plan lecture who, that uh, that Adolf was going to give uh, to uh, these two DSA branches uh, was was just making this this point that we've talked about, right? That um, that the that hyper focusing on uh, on racial disparities and COVID outcomes, you know, leads to us looking in the wrong place, right? You know, like either his immediate concern there, which was the revival of race science, essentially, right? You know, thinking that like you know genetic differences among the races uh, are are going to be more relevant to poverty, or generally not seeing uh, that the issue uh, is poverty and working conditions, which are certainly going to disproportionately impact uh, people in the sectors of the population that have historically been victims of racial injustice, but are more general conditions for lots of other people. Uh, and I guess from my perspective, I would think that this was a relatively, um, you know, I would maybe naively imagine this would be like a relatively uncontroversial thing to say among socialists. Uh, who are, after all, definitionally committed to some kind of class politics, to seeing to see politics through the prism of um, the interests of the working class and how those differ uh, from, um, from the interests of those who own businesses and are at the top of society. Um, 
but, uh, but by the time this happened, what you kind of talk about in the article, and most of the article is devoted to the kind of underlying substantive issue about like how we should think about the relationship between these things, you know, um, racial bias, class structure, you know, uh, the history of all of those things. Mm -hmm. But the, the opening hook, right, is about the way that people were accusing Reed of being a class reductionist, which is basically someone who, you know, the accusation is that you don't really care about anything except for economics and you tell other people not to care about anything except for economics. And this had been so toxified by the time it was supposed to happen that one of the two branches, New York City DSA, uh, had um, officially disassociated itself from the event by the time it happened. And there were concerns about disruption. Uh, and eventually, uh, I think, you know, Reed and, and the remaining organizers just kind of decided it wasn't worth the headache to try to go ahead with, with the talk at that I point. I understand that it was sort of a mutual agreement that this was, they didn't want it, <laughs> the organizers particularly, and Reed didn't feel like, you know, going through the headache of worrying if somebody was going to bounce in his Zoom, you know, talk. Right. And that's why. 